I think there's once in a generation where a new city, so once in our generation, a new city or country will evolve. And once in our children's generation, a new city and country will evolve. And I think this time is it's the Dubai and the UAE. I'm David Merritt. And I'm Francine Lacqua. And this is In the City, Bloomberg's podcast connecting you to the conversations at the heart of the city of London. Now this week, property entrepreneur Nick Candy joins us. Yes, of course, along with his brother, Nick built One Hyde Park in 2010. That was the development that transformed London's luxury housing market and continues to test price records for UK apartments today. Nick, welcome to the podcast. Bring us back to that first loan. Was it 6000 from your grandmother and what you did with it? Yeah, it was in 1995. Uh, my brother was at King's College London. Uh, and the first year you lived in a halls of residence and the second year and third year you had to move out and get your own flat. And so I said to my father, rather than just paying rent to somebody else, why don't you pay rent to me for Christian to live in, like with me? <laughs> That's brotherly love. Uh, so I said, um, you know, grandma's going to lend us some money. He goes, well, how are you going to get the mortgage? And those were the days where you could get a 95% mortgage. And we got a 95% mortgage from the Bank of Wales at the time. And, um, you know, we paid, the flat was £122,000. It was in Redcliffe Square. It was a fourth floor walk up. You walk, open the front door and then literally there was another two flights of staircases. You needed oxygen by the time you actually got into the hallway, which was where the kitchen was. So, and Christian and I uh, did the flat up ourselves. We painted it. We got some new carpet. We put a new kitchen in. But this was at the bottom of the range stuff. This is, we went to Carpet Right. We went to, um, I think it was Magnet Kitchens. And you know, we did it up ourselves. We lived there. Christian was a student at King's College. I was uh, my first year at KPMG. And uh, you know, 18 months later, we ca- somebody came on and said, oh, I want to buy this for £172,000. And so we decided to sell it. And we bought the next flat for £236,000 in uh, Roland Gardens. Um, and we, we sold that um, about six months later for £345,000. And so the journey began. It was by, it was by accident. It was never done on purpose. We never thought we were going to be property developers. And we had a great journey. And it was a time when the London property market was absolutely rising. We, you know, it was just a time and a moment. Obviously, today, that, mo- that you know, London's not doing as well on a global stage as it should be. I still think it's the greatest city on earth, but I don't think it's where it should be as uh, either the city or the country. It's a bit of a shame. You mentioned timing for this. It's a hard trick to pull off now, isn't it, with the sort of prices we've got across a couple. And also those, the 95% mortgages, you can't get those anymore, can you? Yeah, I mean, there's two things. Obviously, that was 30 years ago. So prices would normally, you'd expect them to rise in a major capital city over 30 years. Uh, so yes, prices are very different today. But it, the biggest problem in the country, not just London, for anyone trying to get on the housing ladder to get today, is not supply of property, it's affordability. And what we didn't do here, we should have done while we had the, uh, had the chance, is we should have put 30-year mortgages in place when interest rates were low. Okay, because America has that. You go to buy a home in America, you have a 30-year mortgage. Here in the UK, I think the maximum really mortgage length is about 10 years. And so it's the affordability of uh, mortgages that's the problem, not the actual housing supply. Right, but it's also the, the price of, of houses. So you can have a 30-year mortgage, but if it costs £2 million... Pounds, or six hundred thousand pounds, and you don't have that capital, you know that twenty five percent to start off with, and you're in trouble. Yeah, and that, that that's the problem today. The you know the, the young people coming out of university and stuff to get a mortgage deposit together is not five percent anymore. Where I was, it's twenty five percent, and that's if you're lucky. And so it's a real challenge. And obviously, in the last twelve months, interest rates have shot up because of inflation, and we'll need them to go back down. Others will have a huge problem going forward. Those very higher, you know, much higher interest rates we've got now, what's it doing to the market across the whole spectrum? People are struggling at the bottom end. Is it having any effect at the top, at the super luxury end of the market? Probably doesn't have much effect at the top end, but it, it, it's, ultimately it's not good because also inflation's high. So you, if you buy a big flat or house in London and you want to fit it out, the, you know, the top end, I don't know, 10 years ago, a, a thousand pounds a square foot, is where we, we were fitting out at. And that's everything. That's FF&E, audiovisual curtains and lights. That's absolutely everything. And today, it's going to be £2,000 a square foot. And the, the, those numbers, people think I'm crazy on, but that's what it costs. Nick, when did you and your brother decide to go to the ultra-luxury property market and why? 
it was really by accident. We just kept on going up the ladder of the property ladder and we ended up, you know, looking at flats and houses which were more, more expensive. And so it, it wasn't something that we went out, oh, listen, we want to aim at the uber rich. That it, we, we, it was never started like that. And it was opportunistic. It wasn't strategic. The story around One High Park, can you tell us a little bit more about how you decided that was a project to put your name to? I mean, it was a real landmark uh, development, still is, of course, and, you know, was covered, you know, was made you famous in the news as, as, as developers. Talk us through the story of getting that project off the ground, something so ambitious as that. Well, the, the site itself was always a challenging site because it was a 1970s office building called Bowwater House. And no one really wanted to touch it uh, because it was, you know, a really old office building. But what most people didn't know is there was a restrictive covenant in place between the Mandarin Oriental and Bowwater House. So you couldn't even change a window in Bowwater House without the permission of Mandarin Oriental. Because they're side by side. Yeah, they're side, but they and they're side, but they, but they didn't connect. And so most like, until you got into the legals of this, you, no one would have understood. And so most people would never have touched it because they go, well, they can hold you to ransom. Okay, and so my brother with um, the, his Qatari partner, um, so I, I said I thought we could sort it, and uh, but you know, it was a risk, and you know we knew that the the Keswicks that own the Mandarin Rental, the Jardine Matheson family or group conglomerate, and I said they've got a lot of things missing from their hotel that they'd like. They'd like to have car parking spaces. They would like to have uh, a proper spa underground. They'd like to have an indoor swimming pool. They've got a lot of good things for the hotel already, but they, we can deliver all of this. Um, and so, as I said, it will be a negotiation. So Christian and the, the, his Qatari partner said, let's, let's have a look at it then. And so, and the idea was also to deliver things that were never delivered before in central London, 10,000 square foot floor plates on one level. And everyone said, you know, you're, you're mental. And uh, because these are so big. And still, the record, uh, you know, 85 apartments sold in one high park for circa 2 billion sterling. No one in the world has done that still today. Okay, but I, I think what I'm planning in Dubai next will be able to break some of those records. Why Dubai? I just think Dubai is one of the new capitals of the world. I genuinely think that you're seeing a flow of money there like you've never seen before. It was like London when we were building one high park. The flow of capital to Dubai has changed. And the idea that you might not go and live in Dubai or whatever, people are going, well, I'm fed up with the crime in the, these countries I live in. It's not just London, it's other countries around Europe and the West. And, you know, some of the values that we once cherished in the Western countries are not the same values that we've got today. And actually, you know, who would have thought that the value system sometimes is better in the Middle East than it is here? And I'm sorry to say, that's the case. And people might not like that and stuff, but, that, you know, when young kids in schools are being taught about transgender and stuff, I just don't think it's right. Nick, they're all, I mean, they're also attracting a lot of Russian money. They're also Russian billionaires. We just had an interview with the UA minister who, you know, is also on the gray list for, for dirty money. So there, there's also possibly a reason why Dubai is really exploding in terms of so many people wanting to live there. It's not just Russian money. It's Ukrainian money. It's African. It's Indian. It's Eastern Europe. It's Western Europe. The only really people that haven't gone there en masse yet is the Americans, uh, just because it's a bit further away. And also in America, if you want to leave New York, you might go to Florida. If you want to leave... San Francisco, you might go to Austin, Texas. You don't really need to go to Dubai to do that. So I think that uh, the UAE, yes, of course, it's going to attract some money, which may not be the cleanest money, but every city in the world and country in the world's got that. So it's just like when we've been having it here for years and London benefited from the property market in those times because of that as well. So let's not be naive and try to hide away from it because that's just not uh, that's not true. When you look all around the world, Nick, and, and all your travels, do you think Dubai is the epicenter now of luxury property development, of capital flows? Is that It's the new London, effectively, is it? I think there's once in a generation where a new city, so what, once in our generation, a new city or country will evolve. And once in our children's generation, a new city and country will evolve. And I think this time is it's the Dubai and the UAE. I think they've got an incredible lifestyle, incredible... Uh, you know, for a family, the education system there, healthcare is all improved dramatically after the, over, over the last decade, and their infrastructure is amazing. There's been a lot of controversy in the region, of course, in terms of working conditions. We heard about this in Qatar, obviously, 
with the infrastructure there. Is that anything you're worried about? I mean, you're talking about the finish and the how to get these things actually made, where the work is coming from, what are the conditions that they're working in? Um, the UAE doesn't have quite the same standards, perhaps, as, as Britain or, or the US on this, doesn't it? I think they were slightly behind on some of the standards, uh, but I think they're, they're fully aware of it at the top level, uh, the royal family level, and I think they, they know and they're already making huge efforts to improve it. Uh, genuinely, I mean... Obviously, it has been an issue, uh, but I won't work with anyone that uh, or do anything that puts these people at risk, first of all, while they're on site. But also when they're off site, you're seeing their standards of living change enormously. It's not what it was in the past. So, so Nick, what would be the Candy Brothers' role in this? You basically f fit out the apartments and then you sell them? So it's just me. It's not my brother. So I'm doing this on my own. Um, and um, we are, we're still working that out. But... Uh, Candy's, the candy name will be involved in it in some shape or form. Would you accept Bitcoin as payment? I know you said that in the past. I did say that in the past. Um, would I accept Bitcoin as payment? Good question. Maybe get Bitcoin. I'm not sure all other coins, but uh, maybe Bitcoin. Uh, I think obviously since uh, that's happened, we've uh, since I said that I'd sell one, um, my pen does at one high part for potentially crypto, uh, there's a lot of stuff has changed and moved on. So potentially Bitcoin, but uh, probably not any other coin. Can I just ask you about the overall vibes in London in the market? Because I think we've had a lot of turmoil in recent years. Um, we had the trust disastrous budget. We've had Brexit that's been really disruptive. We've got interest rates going high. How how does London feel as an, as an investment destination now? I mean, yes, a lot is flowing to Dubai, but is London still a good place to invest and buy property and set up businesses? So London, I was born in London. So I was born in Wimbledon. I grew up in um, Surrey. I love London. I think London's the greatest city on earth. However, London has changed. And uh, the calling card, which was so good about London maybe a decade ago or even 20 years ago, I think has changed. And I think that's down to, you know, a number of things. Where if you're sending, if you're from China and you want to send your kids to university here or be educated here and you're reading about the crime in our streets and knife crime, it really, like, would I send my daughter to a place like that? It's what, it's what you're reading and the media coverage of it. And so, first of all, I think crime affects everyone. Uh, and I just think we haven't managed to get a handle on that. I think, you know, if you're carrying a knife in London, there should be no reason for carrying a knife. You know, anyone that's carrying a knife needs to go straight to jail. Pretty drastic. Yeah, no, no joke. But why, why do we need to carry a knife? What, what reason would you and I need to carry a knife in London? If you're caught with a knife on the street, why do you need to carry it? You're going home to, like, chop the bread with your mum, are you? I mean, it's ridiculous. So we, we, unless we have some drastic measures to some of this, it's going to get worse, okay? And so crime uh, is terrible in London. Transport has been, you know, we've become one of the most congested cities in the world. It's taken me an hour to get here today in a car from Chelsea uh, to the Bloomberg offices. It's just, it's just not right. It's not how London used to be. And so we, we've got to solve some of the big problems. And if we can solve some of the big problems, then we've got a really good chance because people want to come and shop, spend, as tourists, be educated, live in London. It's a great city. It's one of the greatest cities in the world. Uh, but it has changed. And so I still think London is a brilliant city. Uh, I think it's a great place to invest. If, we, if you're a foreigner today, which is dollar denominated, then it's one of the greatest times ever to buy real estate in London. Okay, now there's different types of real estate. Would I be buying uh, retail on Oxford Street, which was probably amazing at the time? It's changed completely. And, you know, half the shops are boarded up, which is not very good for one of the greatest cities uh, main streets, but that's what, where it is. You know, obviously, commercial with working from home has been challenging as well. But I think high-end residential real estate. The fact today that you can't build a flat in the city of Westminster larger than two and a half thousand square feet, it is illegal to build a flat bigger. So anyone that's got a flat bigger than two and a half thousand square feet in the city of Westminster is sitting on a rare Picasso or Monet or Renoir. They really are sitting on something quite rare. Because until the laws change again, or if they do change, you've got a huge rarity value, and those things will go up in price. If you always, if you have something rare, it will go up in price over time. Nick, when you look at the livability of, of London, how much does it have to do with, you know, crime or traffic and how much does it have to do with actually taxation? So, of course, taxation is a big part, but, you know, that's that's controlled by central government. And, you know, we've, we're going to see hopefully taxes reduced before the next general election, because otherwise I think, um, you know, the war struggle. So I think taxes can't continue to go up. People, rich people specifically today uh, have choices. So they can get on a plane and go somewhere else. And you've seen that people leaving New York and going to Florida. You've seen people leaving San Francisco and Los Angeles and going to 
uh, Austin, Texas. You're seeing people in the in the UK and other foreign countries around Europe all going to the UAE. Countries where I'd never think about where they would leave. My friends from Zurich, my friends from Vienna and Austria, leaving these places. These are the most conservative cities on the planet. And going to Dubai, you know, I, w I would never have thought my wife and my two girls would ever think about going to live in Dubai. You asked me that three years ago. Today, I'm 100% happy to go. So you're going to be you're going to be based there. No, I'm, I'm not going to be based there initially. I'm going to have offices there. I'll have a home there. But uh, I have a lot of commitments in London. I, my, I would like my kids to go to school in London. But, you know, it depends what goes on and what else happens in the country and, you know, which government's sitting in power and what how crime looks and all that sort of stuff. And depending on all of that, I, I, can, I can get up and go tomorrow. And by the way, so can loads of other people. It's not difficult. And so that makes it, if it's that easy to leave London, Okay, because there's choices for wealthy people. You know, you need wealth. You need wealth generators, people that make money for countries and cities to stay, because oh, there's nothing left. Do you think the government at the moment understand that, or do you think in their pride, you know, we've got a cost of living crisis. It's not a great look, is it, to try to give tax breaks to the richest people? No, but you don't need to give tax breaks. You just need to keep the norm. What the norm from ten years ago? Or the norm from. Four years ago, five years ago. It's not like it's been like changed since you know Boris is prime minister. It doesn't need to change very much. Most people want to live here. I want to live here. I'm saying I want to live here. You know, I think you know this is as I said the greatest city on earth. I think it's better than. Sorry, uh, David. I think you're based in New York, but I, I think it's much better than you. <laughs> so I, I think it's much better than New York. Like t ten times better. I have a home in Los Angeles. I would like to sell my home in Los Angeles. Los Angeles is not the city I remember. Los Angeles was the Disneyland for adults. It's no longer Disneyland for adults. And we speak a lot to, you know, the banking industry, but also the tech industry. So they were all here, King's Cross, and then a lot of them are moving out. We saw that with, for example, Meta. Do, do you feel that, that people kind of were attracted to London and now less attracted to it? I think everyone wants to be in London. If they have a choice of any city in Europe, they want to be in London. More so than Paris, more so than Berlin, more so than... I, I would say it's still up there in the top two or three greatest cities in the world. But we've almost done everything we can to try to kill it. So, um, so we need to try to like foster a new way uh, to bring great things back into London. But you're not talking about Brexit. No, I'm not. I'm not talking about Brexit necessarily. Brexit was the was an opportunity if done correctly. It's just not happened correctly because of a number of reasons. Not stuff necessary in government's control with the swerve ball of COVID. You know, no one knew that was coming or whatever, and so. That was a disaster. And so that made, you know, we spent God knows how many billions that's now put us in as a, the country into debt. Do you have any other big projects in mind in London or are you putting all your energy now and focus on the Middle East? No, I, I have, um, I, I really like the UAE. And so um, Dubai and Abu Dhabi is uh, where I'll focus in the Middle East. And I, I love London. So the right opportunities will come in London. I will, I, um, I will try. And I, I tried to, uh, um, to buy Chelsea Football Club. Oh, we know, Nick. Which uh, my wife says uh, was probably the best thing I didn't buy. But uh, I can I can go as a fan still and enjoy it almost. Well, it hasn't been very enjoyable this season because of the results. But uh, yeah, I'll say. Um, how are you going to fund it? So it was the, it was the strangest thing. So I, I you know I always was going to be the minority shareholder and was going to raise some money. And when I first put my name into the ring, I didn't think like it was ever going to happen. And we we got uh, some emails and calls in from South Korea. And say, so we, we'd like to help fund this with you. We'd like, we'd like to sponsor the stadium. We'd like to sponsor the team. It was like, I thought it was like a radio host, like hoax. Yeah, when someone phones you up, it's like, I said, everyone just be super careful because we don't know who these people are. And let's just see, you know, what happens. And within three days, we had um, bank letters from 1.3 billion sterling. Um, so, which, uh, and then we had a number of other people that uh, came in behind them. And uh, I was really the front man for it, but I wasn't the real, all the money behind it. I was a minority. I was less than 10% of it all. Do you think you could have done a better job than Todd Bowley? It's always easy to say you could do a better job. I've met Todd now, and Todd's, like, Todd is a good man. He super cares about this. He's, he's learning, as we all would. If I, if I take it over, I would have been learning as well. So, of course, he's made some mistakes, and, but we all make mistakes in life, and he's going to try to rectify those. Uh, but his heart's in the right place, and his head's in the right place, and... You know, he needs to put the team together and, you know, he spent a lot of money. So he's definitely, he wants to do good things. There's no doubt about that. Uh, I think he's, you know, the big challenge for him now is two things really in no particular order. One is the stadium. The stadium is not fit for purpose in the modern era. 
if you go to Tottenham Hotspur Stadium, which is probably the best stadium club stadium in the world today, um, that cost Daniel and uh, Joe Lewis one billion sterling at the time. I think if we built that at Chelsea today, that would easily cost with inflation and cost of living and everything else, one and a half billion. The problem with Chelsea's stadium, and every fan needs to understand this, is to get a 60,000 square foot stadium on that footprint, you need to dig down a lot. And that's going to take five years to do, add a lot to the bill, and not necessarily gives you the stadium you want because the footprint of the stadium is too small. I know about this because I helped Roman put the project manager in place when Roman was uh, the owner. And so really, in my opinion, they should be looking to move to Old School. Which is what, up for sale at the moment? It's or not up for sale, um, but th I'm sure they could do a deal with um, Delancey and um, APG that own it. I know a bit about that because um, I might have looked at it myself. So, oh, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, um, so I'm sure you could do a deal with them if it was the right deal for both parties. But if, if it's right for the club and for the fans and for everyone else, all the stakeholders involved, I think, first of all, you can play at Stamford Bridge for the next three, four years with a new stadium's game built. Be much quicker to build a new stadium on a blank piece of site. It's not like two miles away. This is, I think, 500 yards away. So the first thing Todd's got to do is sort out the stadium. Okay. The second thing is obviously he's got to like get us winning again. We're going to see a new manager, maybe Pochettino in place. If it's not him, I'm sure it'd be somebody as qualified as him. And we've got, we've got to get two new number nines, not one number nine, because if you want to play the best in the world, you have to have two. Uh, and then you have to get the you know get rid of the bloated squad and put together a less bloated squad and try to do something with the squad. I it, listen. Todd knows how to do this, so he's done it in America. He's done it in other places. He knows how to do it. He's a really good guy, and I have to say, every engagement I've had with him and uh, Bedad and the rest of the guys, I've really enjoyed, and I think they'll do a good job. And as a fan, I obviously want them to do a good job, and so if I can help them, I'm here to help. But it doesn't have, and I'm a Chelsea fan. It doesn't have the United brand. It doesn't have the United Band, but that's the opportunity. Okay, so if they do the right things in Asia, the Middle East, various other places, they have a huge opportunity. I mean, when I when I was bidding for Chelsea, I spoke to so many different people around the world. I spoke to the Adanis in India. I spoke to lots of different people. You know, cricket is a, a religion in, in India. It's not a sport. It's a religion. And, you know, I thought if I could bring a, a club like Chelsea to India with 1.3, 1.4 population, billion population. They thought, they thought it could be quite interesting. So the opportunity with Chelsea is um, enormous. Also, you, people don't realise that almost all the top CEOs in central London that work for some of the biggest companies in the world all support Chelsea. So they all would like to sponsor, be involved, if the corporate hospitality is done right, et cetera, et cetera. So there's a huge opportunity. And I think he can get his money back from it and can make a good return. But it's not a short-term investment like you buy this for five years and you can get a return. Even without the Super League? Do you think the Super League would be back? I don't think so. I think it, and I'm not sure it would be right either. However, watching Ch Champions League football, if you were there last week versus Real Madrid or at Dortmund a few weeks before that, I mean, the atmosphere on a Tuesday or Wednesday night watching Champions League football in the cold British winter weather, it's not that cold in London compared to some other parts of England. It, there's nothing like it. it the, the atmosphere is just... Unbelievable. It'd be very sad next year that we're not playing Champions League football, but hopefully we'll be back the year after. Who do you think will buy Man United? Is it Middle East money? I reckon it will be either somebody you haven't heard of yet from Saudi, uh, or I think it will be Qatar and Sheikh Jazim. And I know Sheikh Jazim very well. He's a very good man, very sensible man. Uh, I think the Glazers are playing silly buggers. I think the Glazers are pretending they want this minority investment from a Carlisle or a uh, um, Elliot's. Yes, let me tell you, if they get an uh, investment from those sort of people, the, the, it's not going to help the club. Uh, who have we not heard about in Saudi? Can't say. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Nick, thank you so much. <laughs> Thanks for listening to this week's In the City. We'll be back next week. But in the meantime, if you like our show, please head on over to Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen to podcasts and rate, review and subscribe. This episode was hosted by me, David Merritt. And me, Francine Lacqua. It was produced by Summer Sadi and Moses Andam. Additional editing by Blake Maples. And special thanks to Nick Candy. <laughs> <laughs>